This is CBC Windsor News. I'm Lisa Shing and this is a CBC Windsor News special. Southwestern Ontario is a hotbed for fresh fruit, veggies, seasonal fare and of course great restaurants. For the next half hour we'll explore some of our most interesting stories related to food and we'll start with a special guest today. Windsor Mornings Jonathan Pinto arguably has one of the best jobs in this building. Our resident foodie gets to explore every corner of Windsor Essex in search of the fare that makes this region taste great. Now today, Jonathan is going to take us through some of his favorite stories of the last year. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Lisa. I'm going to start with my very first story of 2016. Littlefoot Foods is a Windsor-based company that sells a variety of comfort foods through local stores, farmers markets, and home delivery. What drew me to them was their incredible number of pierogi varieties. I'm talking habanero pierogies, potato, egg, and ham pierogies, even pumpkin pie rogies. And that's just a small sample of the varieties on offer. Rachel Meyer showed me how they're made. We have our potato cheddar mashed potato filling and I've rolled out one of the doughs um, to get started and now we're going to cut the dough with our trusty cutter. So we go really close together. It's okay if they overlap a little bit. That for the whole thing. And then as I'm cutting, Rob is going to fill them in. And then once we're done cutting our pierogi, it's time to fold them. So a little pierogi folding 101. I put the pierogi like that. And then you just fold them like this. And then like you're pinching. And voila, a pierogi. That was Rachel Myers from Littlefoot Foods showing how they make their increasingly famous pierogies. I met up with them in January. Well, Jonathan, I'm wondering what makes these pierogies so unique? It's the dough. It's incredibly thin, so the flavor of the filling really shines. They cook faster, too. <laughs> now, I've got to tell you, Jonathan, I'm a big fan of pierogies, but never tried them from Little Foot Foods, so I'm going to have to do that. <laughs> What's next? Well, one of Canada's oldest bakeries, and it's right here in Windsor, Black's Bakery. It's been at Erie and Langlois since they opened in 1918. Many Windsorites associate the bakery with Punchkis on Shrove Tuesday. But really, Black's is all about rye bread. Here's owner Tony Black showing me the original oven. So I have three loaves here that are ready to put in. We're going to score each of the loaves on top, and this is going to give a opportunity for the loaves uh, to expand as well without cracking. And we're going to score the loaves as well as we're going to run steam into our oven, uh, which keeps the crust of the bread uh, pliable so it can still expand while it's in the oven. And we're just going to give her three diagonal cuts here. There we go. And then we're going to load these onto our peel. So we're going to take a, a cooler place in our oven over here that we're going to put it in. How many loaves of uh, bread can fit in this oven? We, we fit about uh, 200 loaves, 200 to 250 beside, uh, depending on how big the uh, loaves are before they go into the oven. That was Tony Black, owner of Black's Bakery on Langlois Avenue. You know, Jonathan, you're right. I generally do tend to think of punch keys from Black's, but that bread is really, really good. Uh, so what's your next favorite food find? The yeast waffles from Amherstburg's Dalhousie Bistro. And from what I understand, that's unusual. Like most breads, waffles require some sort of leavening agent. In North America, baking soda or powder is normally what's used. Yeast waffles require a little more work. Unlike baking soda or powder-based waffles, yeast waffle batter has to sit and rise for a while. So you have to plan your waffle making in advance. Lawrence Koloff showed me how it's done. Got my yeast dough here for authentic Belgian waffles. And I'm just knocking it down. I've let it risen hour and a half, two hours. You finish it off with the egg whites. 
from the three eggs that were in the batter. You just simply fold and incorporate. Very simple process. This is a must because this is what gives it the nice exterior. Crispy, but not hard. And it just finishes these off beautifully. And as you can see, like any other Easto, it's just beautiful in color. I wish you had smell-o-vision because it is just, it just, it's just, I remember mama, I remember grandma. It just, it has that love smell. What makes a yeast waffle different than a regular waffle, like a non-yeast waffle, I guess? It, it, it's basically the leavening agent of yeast that gives it the richness and the character. It gives it a lot of body and a lot of strength. Um, and it's really a component that once you've tried a, a yeast dough-based waffle, quite honestly, you won't go back. They're that much, they're, they're that nice, I, I think anyways. But if you want to come around here, I'll just show you. Uh, when I said my kitchen was no different than yours, I wasn't joking. I just picked up this other waffle maker at a yard sale. <laughs> to believe somebody would discard a waffle maker is beyond me. So I'll just get in your way. And here I don't worry about overflow because I want my waffle beautiful at all times. I don't care what kind of mess. I make because I want it formed and perfect. Simply put the lid down, walk away, and it'll beat when it's done. Very simple. Open her up. There's your waffle. Nice and crispy on the outside. I mean, not steamed, it's still hot, but it is. It's very well defined. We simply come and hit it with a little bit of icing sugar. Well, video of for us is going to be better to have it on the table. Not too late now. Anyways, and then our fruit compo, which is real berries. There's a lot of love there, Jonathan. You'll thank me later. I know it. <laughs> and then it's really simple. We're not trying to be something we're not. We're just trying to stay true to our philosophy. And voila, there you are, Monsieur. Jonathan, I have to say those look really, really good. They really are, <laughs> and they're incredibly popular. After my story aired, one of their waffle irons actually burnt out from the workout. I'm told they're back to full capacity again. Now, while we're on the topic of breakfast items, another favorite find of mine was something I like to call the Middle Eastern answer to the cheese Danish. It's called kunafe, and I found it at the house of Baklava on Wyandotte Street. Here's how it's made. I just put the phyllo in the tray. So this is ground up phyllo dough? Ground up, yeah. Okay, is there anything else in that dough? Oh, uh, we make it like we mix it with the, with the oil and the milk and some syrup. Okay, so that's all, that's all in there right now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's ready to work. Now it's gonna be, we bake in the dough. So it's basically on, on a grill here. Yeah. And so how long does it take for it to, uh, uh, to cook? It takes a little bit of time here. Okay. Uh, we're gonna melt the cheese. Okay. We put it in the oven. <laughs> so we melt the cheese.
Jonathan, it looks really good, but I'm wondering how do you eat kanafa? Well, you can eat it plain with your hands, but I'd probably use a fork since it's pretty sticky from the syrup. Warm it up in the microwave for a few seconds and you're ready to go. Isho likes to top the kanafa with ground pistachios. But another popular way to eat kanafa is as the filling in a sandwich. I'm told it goes especially well in a specially made flat circular bun studded with sesame seeds. That sounds like an incredible, amazing, delicious <laughs> breakfast treat. Oh, uh, what's next? Well, sticking with the Middle Eastern theme, I want to talk about one of my most popular stories of the year. The shawarma pizza from Arcata Pizzeria on Dougal Avenue. This story went absolutely wild online. People couldn't resist the combination of two of Windsor's most beloved foods. Just starting by after being marinated for two days, start putting them in the oven, cook them, and get them ready for the busy weekend. And here we go. Tell me what we're doing now. First, you try to stretch the pizza out. Just open it up. Get rid of all the bubbles. And make it all even from all sides. Because we're making a, a chicken shawarma, I have to pre-cook pre -cook the crust. So just a second. If you take it too early, you're going to do that. It's ready to be. How much do you like garlic? Love garlic. You love garlic? So do you make the garlic sauce here? Yes, we do. We have to. Okay. Then get some cheese. Take your chicken shawarma. It's been marinating. We chopped it smaller and thinner. Toss it in the oven again. And so what's that? This is the garlic pesto. Now most shawarma, shawarma doesn't usually come with pesto, so why, why did you add this to this chicken shawarma pizza? It just, our take on it, and it, we tried it, we tried it, it tastes so good. And appealing to the eye. Mm -hmm. This is the final product, and it comes with pickles and turnips on the side. So Jonathan, pesto, not normally going with shawarma, as we heard in the video. Oh, tell us more about that. Well, Bob told me they just found it worked really well with the pizza version, and I would have to agree. Since this is a fusion food, I'm okay with a bit of poetic license. You know, I really love trying that shawarma pizza, but I have to admit it's really heavy, so I don't think I'd be able to eat any more than, <laughs> you know, one slice at a time. Jonathan, we have time for one more food find. What is that? It would have to be my pilgrimage to one of this city's oldest and best supermarkets, La Stella. I've been shopping at La Stella supermarkets since I moved to Windsor four years ago. It's one of my favorite places in the city, and it's all because of the pasta aisle. Okay, first of all, we got this. One of my favorites is the pepperoni, pepperoncini pasta. And this you have with oil and garlic. That's it. Hmm. it brings out the flavor. Then we have, uh, we have this pasta here. It's, it's handmade. Then it comes from Italy, the Calabria area. And these are all handmade. It takes a little longer to cook, but it's dynamite. Does most of your pasta come from Italy or does it come from Canada no, too? No, Italy. Yeah, well, okay. I only carry one, uh, actually two domestic, uh, Primo and Ital Pasta, but mo all of the rest is all from Italy. Where Different do your customers? Where do your customers come from? All over. Uh, we've got some from, well, East End, West End of Windsor. We have uh, American customers. We also have customers from Chatham, Leamington area, a few from London. They come here. Hmm. So that's and, what uh, it is. There's another new pasta. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a whole wheat pasta we carry. 
It's one of the best companies in Italy, <laughs> and it's uh, very good. And I got a new new pasta this time, and it's shaped like a hat, like a sombrero hat. And it's got um, a little flat piece in the bottom. You put this in the oven, you stuff them with uh, meat, cheese, whatever, and put them in the oven. I don't know how long it takes, but this is new, new cut, new pasta. Never seen this before. And then we have also bow ties, different color, Italian flag, you know. Cool. All kinds of different, anything you can think of, we have. Jonathan, that is a ton of pasta out of that entire selection. Do you have any favorites? Well, ever since Jimmy introduced me to that pasta made with chilies, I've been hooked. I also love spaghettini. It's a little finer than regular spaghetti, not quite vermicelli. It's perfect with a hearty meat sauce. All right, I've got to try that. Thanks so much for sharing some of your tastiest stories of 2016, Jonathan. My pleasure, Lisa. All right, Jonathan Pinto is Windsor Morning's resident foodie. You can hear his latest food adventure every Friday morning at 810 on CBC Radio 1. That's 97.5 FM in Windsor. Now coming up, we'll take a look at another side of the food industry where food labels broke federal law. Stay with us.